this episode, we'll be looking at a Git to Puppet deployment workflow pattern. I'd like to cover how Puppet code gets from your workstation onto production servers and look at the bits in between. This diagram is basically the deployment workflow in a nutshell, but before we dive in, I should mention that I have no idea if this is a recommended solution. It just seems to work well for me, so I thought I would share. I'm only concerned with managing the operating system and services, so I'm not deploying custom-made applications which would require continuous integration systems. This deployment workflow grew very organically as we started playing around with Puppet and then wanted to go into production. It took me quite a bit of reading and then trial and error to get this figured out. So I thought it would be worthwhile to share my experience. So if you're doing something similar, you have a bit of a reference point. Let me jump back for a minute and give you a bit of history about how this workflow came to be. First off, Puppet is a configuration management tool created by Puppet Labs which allows you to automate many sysadmin type tasks. Typically, Puppet is a client server application where you deploy manifests and modules to a Puppet server which describe how the configuration is supposed to look on end server machines. Puppet comes as a commercial product along with an open source version. In this episode, I'm talking about using the free open source version. So let's say you think Puppet sounds cool and you start playing around with it. Maybe you even watched episode number 8 where I talk about learning Puppet with Vagrant. After this point, you think it would be cool to use Puppet in production. This is where the deployment workflow comes into play. The recommended best practice is that you put your Puppet code into revision control. So how do you get from revision control to the Puppet Master and then finally the configuration onto the client machines? Well, this is what I plan to talk about today. For you to really understand how this deployment workflow functions, we should probably chat about where the main pieces are and how changes flow through the system. So what are the main pieces? Well, we have our ops and dev staff over here. These are the guys and gals writing Puppet code on their workstations. Next, we have a central Git version control system, which holds our entire Puppet code base. This Git server is also running Gitolite for user authentication. I chat about using a central Git server in Gitolite in episode number 11. This central Git server is a bit special though, in that we have GitWeb pointing at the Puppet code repository. GitWeb allows you to explore Git repositories through a web interface. For example, you can easily browse the revision history, file contents, logs, view diffs, and even search the repository. But the real magic happens by using something called Git hooks. These allow you to program actions like sending email or running a script when a predefined action happens to a repository. In this workflow, we're using three Git hooks. The first one is a pre-commit hook. This checks each commit on the repository and only allows commits with valid Puppet syntax. Those with bad syntax are rejected and the submitter is shown a detailed error message. There's actually a great video overview of this in action on the Puppet Labs YouTube page. You can find the link in the episode notes below. Next, we have two post receive hooks. The first one is an email hook, and it grabs our git commit details and sends it off to the ops and dev staff, along with a link to the GitWeb dashboard for easy viewing via web interface. This allows everyone to be in the loop as changes flow through the system and to quickly track down changes which might have caused issues or broken something. The second post receive hook takes care of the git to puppet master sync. This is actually a bash script called from the post receive hook but at its heart is a method which dumps the git puppet repo to disk, then rsyncs it over to the puppet master. This might not be a best practice, but it seems to work really well in our use case. I would really like to hear how you're using puppet if you're trying something similar and it works for you. In this next section, we have our puppet master and the puppet dashboard. So the code base comes over from the git repo on each commit via the post receive hook. Then we have our puppet agents checking in with the puppet master server every 30 minutes looking for updates. So you can track the changes and progress of the updates using the puppet dashboard. I should also mention that we have a central logging system. So everything from the clients, puppet master and Git goes into the logging system. This allows us to track errors across all machines, although it's a bit out of the scope for this discussion. Okay, so now that we know how the workflow functions at a high level, let's push through an example puppet change. For the sake of this example, let's say that we have a staff member who wants to deploy an SSHD configuration tweak, which will make sure SSH is installed and configured on an end node. So we have our staff member, let's call him Justin, and he wants to deploy this SSH configuration change onto some nodes managed by Puppet. He worked locally on his system using Vagrant to test and verify changes he wants to push out. 
he is finally happy so he pushes the code into the central git repository, where the syntax is checked via the pre-commit hook. Luckily it appears ok, so the commit is accepted. Immediately, the post receive hook is triggered, sending an email notification out to the ops and dev staff with the particulars about the commit, including a link to view the commit on GitWeb. Finally, a second post receive hook fires. This syncs the Git repo with the Puppet Master. I should mention that the deployment from a staff workstation to the Puppet Master actually happens in a matter of seconds. We're just breaking this apart and really examining the process in detail. Finally, Puppet clients begin to check in on a rolling 30 minute cycle, and we watch updates via the dashboard and our central logging system. So that's basically it. I will likely create several more episodes going into detail about the Git hooks, Git web, and the Puppet server and dashboard. However, I just wanted to get this out there in case you run into similar issues as I did. There is also lots of development documentation out on the Puppet Labs website about using Git branches and Puppet environments. This is worth checking out and the links are in the episode notes below. Also, while doing research I ran across ways to optimize the Git to Puppet deployment workflow, which looks like it might be useful. I've also included this in the episode notes below. Just to wrap up, here's what I think are good things about this pattern. There is accountability and traceability for each commit flowing into the system, so you have an idea of who did what and when. Notifications keep everyone in a loop and allow for quick debugging. Even though this diagram looks complex, it's actually really simple and broken into manageable pieces, which do one thing and you can easily swap them in and out, or be improved. One thing that I would like to add to this is the ability to do code reviews or sign-offs, so that you have a second set of eyes before they flow into the production Puppet Master. Just as an aside, this workflow is also good for other things too. For example, I deploy this very website using something very similar, except rather than rsync to a Puppet Master, I have my website repo synced to the infrastructure running the site, and it pushes the website content out. The beauty in these hooks is that you can write whatever you want in there, and it can really streamline your deployment process. Just before we end this episode, and as a bit of a bonus, I found some really interesting links while doing research for this episode, in relation to Puppet in AWS during the Obama presidential campaign in that the operations staff went from relatively nothing to thousands of machines managed by Puppet and AWS. If you have any interest in Puppet or AWS, I highly recommend checking these out. I've included these links in the episode notes below. All right, that concludes this episode. Thanks for watching. If you would like to get notified about future episodes, please subscribe to my mailing list. You can do this by going to the Get Notified link in the header and entering your email address. Have questions, comments, or concerns about this episode? What about episode ideas? I'd love to hear your feedback, either good or bad. Shoot me an email, justin at sysadmincasts.com.